Well, my name is Adam Hoffman. I'm professor of environmental chemistry here at the University of Dubuque. Um, it's my 11th year here at the University of Dubuque. And here I do a variety of things. Um, most recently I was appointed to department head of the Natural and Applied Sciences. Um, I teach a variety of classes, including environmental science classes, chemistry classes, um, some activities classes. Um, I also advise a student organization on campus, the Web of Life, and Web of Life looks at educational outreach and awareness related to environmental issues. Um, I also have directed the Clappity Summer Fellowship Program and the Butler Summer Fellowship Program for the past seven years. And the University of Dubuque is a really special place for me. So when I first interviewed and, and set foot on campus, I knew it was a perfect fit for me. So my background is I did undergraduate research at a small liberal arts institution, and then I got my PhD at a large um, public university. And I knew that I loved the small campus feel and the connection between students at a smaller place. And even you, this, the University of Dubuque just provides a great opportunity for me to, to do what I love and to connect with the students and help connect the students to the natural world. I was really interested in environmental science before I even knew what environmental science or environmental chemistry was. So from a young age, just always being outside, exploring the world, trying to figure out how the world around me works. And I think as I continued academically, I would skirt around that. I was super interested in biology, super interested in chemistry, and then I, and geology, and then I really found kind of the perfect middle where I could really explore the world around me and ask and answer questions and try and figure out how the world works, why it works that way, what we can do to help the earth, um, what we can do to help the earth help us. Um, so really it was that reciprocity relationship of, of the world around us, what's going on, and how can I figure out how this dang thing works is what really drew me to this area. And today we're gonna to be talking about water. And what I don't want to do is make the mistake that I made at one of my very first lectures here at the University of Dubuque. I had given, in all accounts, and certainly in my mind, a fantastic general chemistry lecture when a hand shot up in the back. Um, that person, after 50 minutes of enthralling chemistry, said, why is this important? And it just struck me right to the core. So that's what we have to start off with. First is why. Right, so why are we going to talk about water today? Um, for me, there's a personal connection to water. Um, I grew up in Minnesota, so I think a better question to ask would be, why not water? Um, so I grew up chasing frogs in the creek. I grew up every summer going to the lake, recreating in the cabin. I did grad school at UW-Madison on the lake shores, or probably on the shores of Lake Mendota. Uh, and now I'm here and staring at the Mississippi every day. So for me, there's a real personal connection um, to water. But let's zoom out a little bit. So pretend now uh, that I hold all the water in the world here in my hand. So we have a thousand liters uh, of water right here, which represents all the water on Earth. What I'm going to first do is pour out a little bit here. So here we still have 970 milliliters of water. And here we have 30 milliliters of water. What I'm going to do to this big chunk, 97% of the water on Earth, right, is salt water. So as you may or may not know, salt water is not good for drinking. It's not good for washing cars. It's not good for growing crops, right? So it's not water we can utilize in our everyday life. Right, so that's an issue. So now we're down to this. So this is our fresh water on the Earth's surface. And what I'm going to do here is pour all but six mils of it into our ice cube tray here. So this represents all the fresh water that's locked up into ice and glaciers. Right? And if you've ever tried to take a bath with a glacier, wash your car with a glacier, that's not going to work. Right? So I'm going to put this over with our salt water. Right? So now this is all the water on the surface of the earth. And here we have stuff that's salty and or locked up in ice. All right, so now I'm going to say, so this is the fresh water now in this container that is not salty and not locked up in ice. Right? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove one drop from this container. Right? There's one drop that's going to drop right there. So that drop right there represents all the potable fresh water on our Earth's surface. 
right? So although we might look around where we live and we see water all around us, there's only a small amount that's available. So with that small amount that's readily potable, we have to work amazingly hard to make sure that we ensure that that water stays potable, stays useful, stays for drinking and farming for us, but also into the future. So that's why we care about water, and that's what we're gonna look at today. So today I'm gonna to talk about water pollution. And often when we think of water pollution, we think of stuff floating in the water, water bottles, garbage floating, paper, stuff we can see. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about nutrient pollution. And specifically, the term we're gonna use is eutrophication. And eutrophication, I like to think of it as too much of a good thing. It's when we have nutrients, and specifically two primarily, phosphorus and nitrogen, when we have excess nutrients entering bodies of water. We see some detrimental effects. So these nutrients are really important for growth, but when we have too much nutrients entering our system, we get too much growth, and ironically, it's not just the growth, but also the death. So when we have death of these aquatic plants and algae, as a byproduct, we also lose oxygen in our system. So this excess of growth, growth and this death is gonna pose a really big problem. And eutrophication happens naturally. Over long periods of time, um, nutrients like grass clippings and trees and animals end up in lakes and gradually they fill up. But the problem is cultural eutrophication. We're speeding up this process that's occurring, right? So what I'm gonna first do is set the stage and talk a little bit about the problem then I'm gonna talk about causes of that problem, and then I'm gonna go into solutions, what you can do to help this problem, and then I'm gonna examine what my students and I are doing to investigate and tackle this problem. So the EPA calls nutrient pollution one of America's most challenging environmental and economic problems. So there are three major sources of nutrient pollution. So the first one that we hear lots about is agricultural pollution. So excess phosphorus and nitrogen run off from farm fields during storm or rain events. Um, it can also be due to application of, over application of fertilizer or manure. So that certainly plays a role. Storm water and uh, water, wastewater treatment plants also play a role. So we treat our waste and release that into the environment and that can pose a problem. But also in the urban environment, we do things that can cause problems with nutrient pollution as well. So fertilizing of lawns and gardens can wash into stormwater and directly into rivers and lakes. Um, pet waste can do the same, as well as leaves and grass clippings. So those are all sources of nitrogen phosphorus that impact our water bodies. So what effects does that have? It affects people, profit, and planet. So as we increase nitrogen and phosphorus to aquatic water bodies, we get increased growth of plants, but primarily algae. So one issue with that is toxic algae. So you can have toxic algae blooms and that can directly impact the health of humans and animals. Um, there's also economic concern as well. If you imagine trying to um, recreate in a algae filled lake is less likely to happen or be a lot less fun than doing so in a nice clean lake. So resorts and real estate really are impacted by poor water quality and algae filled lakes. Um, but it's also a problem for the planet as well. There's over 400 dead zones in the world with nearly 200 of them in the United States. And what occurs as nutrients wash into water bodies, we see an increased growth of plant and algae. This increased growth essentially eventually leads to death and the breakdown process of these decaying organisms use up oxygen. When oxygen is used up, it's not readily available for fish, crabs, and a whole host of animals that rely on the getting their oxygen from the water. They're called dead zones because life basically ceases to exist in those areas. And that's really problematic um, for folks who rely on that for economic reasons like fishing or recreating or stuff like that. And it certainly wreaks havoc on the ecosystem and changes the dynamics that are going on in play there. So what can you do to help the problem? Well, certainly you can be very mindful around the house of detergents you use. So phosphorus 
is commonly found in dishwashing and laundry detergents. So choosing phosphorus-free alternatives is something really important to do. Also, whether you are a backyard farmer or a large agricultural farmer, you can ensure that you're using best management practices to keep any fertilizer that you place on your crops in place. Um, you can make sure your septic system is up to code and is serviced annually. And you can also make sure that grass clippings, leaves, and other things stay out, uh, out of the waterways. Um, and then most importantly, you can really educate others on this. So I think we are all teachers to some degree, and I think it's really important to pass along this knowledge that nutrient pollution really impacts people, profit, and planet, and there's something that we can do about this problem. So what are my students and I doing about this problem? So we have teamed up with a variety of folks. We have teamed up from colleagues with the University of Iowa, University of Wisconsin-Madison, University of Wisconsin-Platteville, and we are measuring water quality at a variety of different spots. So one important thing we do is before putting in management practices, so before changing stuff we're doing to the land, we monitor what's going on. So we get baseline data. And that's what we're doing right now throughout the Dubuque County. So we are monitoring 30 different sub-watersheds, and we are just getting baseline values of nitrogen and phosphorus entering the different streams in those areas. And the city of Dubuque, just signed an agreement with um, the Iowa DNR to do some really fantastic land management practices. And with our baseline data, we can continually measure how this is impacting nitrogen and phosphorus coming into our system. The other thing we do is we measure the impact that rain events have on the introduction of nitrogen and phosphorus into water bodies. So one of the primary ways nitrogen and phosphorus come in is runoff over land. So we can look at the impact that rain events has on that. As climactic conditions change and we get more and larger um, volumes of water running off, we can look at what's going to happen to our streams and our water bodies. The other thing we do is we're putting in best management practices like cover crops or buffers or no-till. We can really measure the impact that those things have on nitrogen and phosphorus entering water bodies. So one of the main reasons we're doing our Dubuque County project is there's going to be lots of money allocated to farmers throughout the county. And we want to help the county best determine where that money can be most efficiently and effectively spent. So we want to target the areas that are most problematic. And lastly, my students and I are looking at the role that biogeochemistry plays in phosphorus and nitrogen cycling within the aquatic environment. So no two water bodies are exactly the same. If we add phosphorus, the same amount of phosphorus to two different water bodies, they can behave a lot differently. So we're looking at some of the biogeochemical differences in the sediment in these water bodies to see why that is occurring. So my students and I are really asking and answering questions related to nutrient pollution in the world around us. How are the nutrients getting there? How can we best contain those nutrients? And when in this system, how can we pull nutrients out of that and remediate it? So I think there's a variety of reasons um, that UD is a fantastically special place. Um, but one of the most important um, that I've come to appreciate, love, and respect is just the connection between students and faculty and staff, faculty, faculty, and staff, and staff, faculty, and students. So I think they're just an amazing connection that takes place on this campus um, that really comes out of people caring about what they're doing. So I think when you care about what you're doing and the people you're doing it with, um, it just transforms anything. And, and in this learning space we have here, it just really trans transforms it. And the students I know um, can tell that I have concern for them, first and foremost, them, their well-being. Um, and then once they realize that, the next part about getting them buying into content and what I'm teaching, that's really the easy part. So I think first it's just the personal relationship and connections that have to be made. And really it starts with the top. I mean, President Bullock's fantastic and anytime you see him walking around campus, he will say hi to you and talk to everyone. And I mean, and one of my favorite things about campus, I was thinking about this this summer as I was um, walking across the campus at UW-Madison, which obviously, as most of you know, is a much larger campus than the University of Dubuque. But it takes me longer to walk across campus at UD because I want to talk with every single person I meet, all the students, all the faculty, the maintenance people, the people that make these grounds look fantastic, the librarians, just, it, it's a fantastic place to be uh, just because of the people. So I really think the people make this a very special, unique place.
And welcome, here we are at the North Fork of Catfish Creek. So we talked before about expanding the walls of learning outside of the classroom. So this is a good example of one of our common spots that we stop at for classroom work. But as well as, this is one of our sampling sites, one of the 30 stops in Dubuque County. So really when I'm coming out here, I'm looking all the beauty behind me, I'm in the creek. This is where it really hits me that I'm getting paid to do this work and it's part of the mission of the university. So it's here where that I really feel like I hit my calling of lifelong learning, of engaging students in so scholarship, in relationship building, and, and certainly as well stewardship. So one of my favorite quotes relating to stewardship is that we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And really out here, I feel like when I'm working with water and helping make this resource better for the future, right, and that's directly um, impacted and hits home every single time as I'm staring at the students working with me or even my kids when I bring out sampling with me as well. So this is where I really feel like um, my mission intersects the most with the University of Dubuque when I'm out here with my students uh, doing stewardship work. So some of the tools that we need to do uh, this scholarship. Um, so this here is our ISCO automated sampler. So this ISCO sampler is fantastic. We have three of these, and this one was purchased through work with DMA SWA, the solid waste agency in town. And what these are fantastic for, as their name suggests, as automated samplers, is we don't have to be out here to make them sample. So what we can do is we can program them, and we hook them up with the tubing into water, and then what that allows is for samples to be taken when we're not here. So what we do is we set that to sample based on increases in water height. So if we have a rain or a runoff event, this gets triggered and it can take samples however often we want, every half hour, every hour, every minute, right? So this is really beneficial if we have thunderstorms that we can't get out in, or if we have rain events on a Sunday morning at 2 a.m., right? So these are really fantastic for sampling consistently on a consistent basis. They're also helpful for doing pre and post sampling. So we can set these up like we did with the landfill, pre-landfill and post-landfill in the stream. So we can really compare each of our samples from each and the analysis we do from each and figure out what goes into the stream prior to going to the landfill and then what comes out afterwards, right? And if there is less coming out, that means it's being stored in that stream reach, which is really fantastic. If more nitrogen or phosphorus is coming out than putting in, that means that land between those two is in fact a source of nitrogen or phosphorus, right? So these are really helpful in pre and post things. So these are automated samplers. We have to go out, set them up, come back and collect the samples, but they're really fantastic. But when we come out to a site like this, we're really usually going to take grab samples. So my students and I come out and take grab samples at each spot. Uh, we do this quarterly during rain events and non-rain events. And really all this consists of is, as its name suggests, grabbing a sample from our spot. So a couple of important things we want to know when we're sampling, you always want to stand downstream so we're not stirring up the sediment, right? With our sample, we're always going to rinse three times. And importantly, when we go back to the lab, then we can do a variety of different analyses with this stuff here. So here we'll just take a grab sample from the North Fork here of Catfish Creek. So we're going to go upstream. And we fill it up, cap it off and label it. So this goes in ice, and then this goes back to the laboratory where we can do a variety of different things. Today I've mostly talked about nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, but we're also measuring pH, dissolved oxygen, chlorides, conductivity, uh, E. coli for biological um, contamination as well. Um, so we're really looking at a variety of different things using these uh, samples here. And also when we're sampling at these spots, we can get some readings right away. So we have these probes that we can stick in the water. So these probes read a variety of different chemical water quality measurements. And we have our handheld device here. So all we have to do is turn it on, stick those probes in the water, and this will give us information on dissolved oxygen, temperature in the water, and a whole host of different things. So we'll get some real-time data right away, and some stuff we'll bring back to the lab. So what I've spoken about so far has been water sampling, 
right? But also sediment is really important as well because we have some nitrogen and phosphorus, right, that's washing in from the land here that's associated or bound to particles. So we need to also be able to measure the nitrogen and phosphorus in those sediments, right? So this tube isn't conducive for this small crick right here. We would use this tube in um, larger lake environments. So like Devil's Lake when we're doing that, or Lake Vekwa Hund. Um, in Sweden, we're going to use this to drop down into the sediment. We have a large coring device that weighs about 80 pounds. It drops it down into the sediment, and then we'll get some sediment below and some water above. So importantly, then we can section that off into slices, and we can measure the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus in those specific slices. Right? This is the other piece of the puzzle, the water and, and the sediment. So here we have a sediment core um, that we just took here from the north branch of Catfish Creek, right? And here you can see the sediment at the bottom and where the water and sediment meet is that sediment water interface. And some really important chemistry goes on there. As we go down our sediment core, we tend to have anoxic environments or no oxygen. So we have reducing environments. So different forms of our chemical compounds and our elements are going to exist there than at the very top interface where we have oxygenated water as well as oxygenated part of our sediment. So there's really interesting chemistry going on in here, and we get to that by slicing this in really small layers and analyzing those different layers, right? So when we're trying to characterize nitrogen and phosphorus, nutrient cycling and nutrient pollution, we need to look at the water column, we need to look at the water in the sediment, as well as the sediment in itself. If we can characterize those three things, we have our entire knowledge of where our nitrogen and phosphorus exist in our systems. So I want to thank you for joining me out here today. Uh, this is what I'm blessed to be able to do every day and share with my students. And I would really appreciate to hear back from you all as well. If you have spots around Dubuque County that you would like monitored, if you would like to know more about water quality, um, eutrophication, nutrient pollution, please reach out to me. And I would be more than happy to continue the conversation. Thank you. One really fantastic aspect of alumni from our program and I think our university in general is um, that when they catch the passion they're really eager to share it with us so when I get phone calls or letters or emails from students it's really 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 clear that what I'm doing and what everyone is doing here on campus is making a difference and that really just fuels my fire uh, on a day where a lecture might not go good or a class bombs a test, when I can just open up some of those emails that I have saved in a folder to realize why I'm doing this, it's just really motivating for me and it's really fantastic.